All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. I see we've got a nice discussion uh, taking place in the chat window already, so thank you for that. Uh, we just wanna welcome you and thank you again for, for joining us today for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, which is a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU also provides student learning services for K-12 students through the Michigan Virtual School, as well as professional development opportunities and blended and online learning through its professional learning services division. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started today, this webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. Today, we're going to be learning all about Quality Matters and Quality Matters in Michigan. We are incredibly excited to have Christine Volker from Quality Matters talk with us about her program. With that, I'm going to hand it over to her and allow her to introduce herself. All right. Thank you so much, Justin, for having us today. Uh, my name is Christine Volker, and I am the K-12 Program Director for Quality Matters. And uh, joining me from Quality Matters here today is Maggie Bacon, who's our K-12 program coordinator. And she works closely with me and also many of our Michigan members. So we're happy to have her with us. Um, I'm going to be doing most of the talking, but I'm going to invite Maggie to please jump in if there's anything you think I've overlooked. Um, and to everybody here, please ask questions in the chat. And, um, Maggie, I'm sure, will be moderating that and, and take care of any questions that are in here. And uh, thank you, Justin, for being excited for having us. We're really excited to be here um, to share what we're doing uh, here in Michigan. So thank you again uh, for having us. Before I jump in, I just wanted to, to tell you all a little bit more about me so you know where I'm coming from. I've been involved in K-12 education for over 20 years. I know that's kind of dating myself. Um, in my home district where I first started, I opened uh, three brand new media centers at the elementary, middle, and high school levels before I eventually moved on to the central office where I was named a technology integration specialist. And I did PD for the teachers across a large district, which was made up of 24 schools. At the time, I worked on partnership grants with other districts across my state. And like so many of you, uh, because of my early embracing of instructional technology, I was tapped into uh, starting up the online learning program for my district. And this was a big undertaking for me because of the limited resources that were available um, in terms of setting up our program and all that that entails uh, to identifying and also vetting courses that we wanted to use with our students. Um, so I wanted to share my background with you because that's why um, I'm here today. That's the work that I do today with schools and districts, and that's why it's so rewarding to me because that struggle is is real, and I've been there. And my job now is to help you all feel empowered um, that we can do this together. So with that, um, I'm going to answer your first question, which I know is brewing in all of your minds. So. <laughs> What is Quality Matters or QM? So we are a nonprofit organization that's supported by research and current best practices. And we're peer-based, which means that we foster a community that serves to support and help one another to provide the best online learning experiences we can for students. Um, let's see. So we do. Um, 
we do offer a quality what we what we have is a kind of like a quality assurance toolkit so it's all kind of like turnkey so you'll see on the screen there are those icons that's going to be representative of um, a rubric for quality assurance standards standards and guidelines um, we also have professional development to help implement um, some of our tools and resources and, and take things a step further. And then we also have a peer course review process. And I'll be touching on all of those different aspects of, of um, those tools and how Michigan is using them today. So we are membership based and our members come from all over the globe and we have over 1,000 institutions um, and my favorite things about our members is hearing them say that they can talk to people in other organizations in other states um, who are doing the same sorts of things as them but they can talk to them with this common language around quality assurance um, that they all have through that common thread with QM. So that's kind of neat. Um, here in Michigan, we have a pretty robust membership base. Uh, and I'll let you, uh, you Justin, uh, tell more about that. Sure. So I, I really just wanted to, before we get in, started in learning more about QM as an organization and, and what they do here in Michigan, I really just kind of wanted to lay out the case for the importance of quality in Michigan. So um, the importance of quality, the, the how quality is stressed, how quality is controlled for in our state especially. Uh, the first thing I just kind of wanted to talk about very briefly is um, what we call 21F, or the Course Choice Program here in Michigan, uh, in which any school district or ISD community college who wants to offer an online course statewide under this program called 21F, uh, they have to have the results of a quality review attached. Um, that review must be conducted according to a set of guidelines, which we'll talk about a little later in the presentation, um, that includes not only the process that we've kind of put together around a set of standards from INACOL, but also the QM review process, which we know uh, by working with QM and having partnered with them for a while, uh, really does impact the quality of courses and impacts the quality of offerings that we see in our state. Uh, additionally, uh, the course review is intended to help districts when selecting the virtual courses that they want to offer for their students or the, um, not, not just offer for their students, but offer statewide, right? Uh, or which courses that they want to enroll their own students in. So um, it, it really brings kind of uh, the importance out and being mindful about how that course might fare uh, in a course review process. That also comes into play when you talk, when you talk about district developed courses, right? So um, these are the kinds of structures that we have around quality in Michigan and why I think not just uh, QM, but other partners that we work with are incredibly important to the work that we do to try to ensure quality in our state. Uh, lastly, I really just want to make mention of the overall context for vir virtual learning here in our state. Um, according to our own research, we've seen a completion rate of virtual courses that typically hovers around 60%, which is a pretty low benchmark. Uh, and that's held constant each year for about the last five years. I'm going to post the link to the report that we do, uh, or at least our, the most recent report that we do every year, so you can get more information about that virtual completion rate. So it's really important to consider how the quality of online courses might be impacting that performance rate. Uh, and it's important for us to consider uh, the fact that we should be putting quality courses in front of students to try and ensure the highest level of success that we can for those students. Right, and that's, and that's really why we're all here, um, to provide those students with the best learning experience that we can. So I'll talk a little bit more about how membership in Michigan is set up. Um, uh, a lot of times in, in Michigan, we'll see that an ISD um, holds the membership, but that ISD then, um, that membership trickles down to the schools and districts that they serve. So you'll see there on that graphic, there is the ISD. Um, they might serve maybe four school districts. Um, and then that ultimately pans out into serving all of the teachers amongst that district. So our membership really um, spans that, that wide spectrum there. And so the ISD holds the membership, but in turn, all of the different school districts that are served by, by that ISD also has a membership 
through them. So while they have a membership, the membership is held by the ISD, but they still are covered and can use all of our tools and processes. So um, I wanted to just say how that's set up. Um, and those schools and districts are coming from different starting points. So they might be offering third-party courses uh, for to their students. So they might be looking at vendors who offer courses and, and choosing um, which courses would be best according to their needs. Maybe they have a, um, you know, a gap that they need to fill. So they're looking for those third-party courses. Sometimes they're coming to us because um, they have locally developed courses. So they're developing courses on their own from scratch. Um, and we provide tools and resources to help them to develop those courses. Um, they might be having blended courses. And so we provide some tools to help them with that. And a lot of times people come to us uh, to get that certification. And I'll talk more about what our certification mark means and how to uh, get that certification. But um, a lot of times that helps schools and districts get that leverage they need um, to be competitive and to really show that their course um, is a well-developed course and it has been through a rigorous external review process. So we do have, I, I mentioned that we do have those, those um, that toolkit. And the first thing I'm going to start off with is, is talking about our rubric. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk about, the rubric and the tools associated uh, with that rubric. So we do, at Quality Matters, have five different rubrics for online and blended courses. So you'll see there we have a higher education rubric. We have a higher education publisher rubric. That's pretty much for vendors who are you know, selling or developing their courses for higher education purposes. Um, then we have a K-12 secondary rubric, which is uh, what most of you on this call would, would are using. And then um, our K-12 publisher rubric, um, and that a lot of people use to vet vendor courses. And then uh, we also have a continuing and professional education rubric. And a lot of times we'll see schools and districts use this to, um, to help develop professional um, development courses or to, um, to vet professional development that they might enroll their teachers in. So those are the five different rubrics. This one is our K-12 secondary rubric. Um, this is the fourth edi edition of our rubric. And we do revise it uh, periodically. It's, it's a pretty much a dynamic document. And it changes as our understanding of online and blended learning grows. So it does reflect. Um, research and current best practices. So whenever we, we revise our rubric, and currently we've been revising it on a, on a three-year period. And so when we revise our rubric, um, we go through and we, we choose a team of, last time we had a team of 12 from organizations around the country. Um, they're teachers, they're instructional designers who are in the trenches right now. And so what we do is they go through, we do a literature review um, that, that serves to inform each and every standard that goes into this rubric. Um, so that's what I mean by they're supported by research. So if we see things that are changing in the research and it has to do with a specific standard or even a standard that we don't currently have in the rubric, we'll look at that um, and see if maybe it needs to be adopted into the rubric, if we need a certain specific standard for that, or if there are things that we need to do to change the rubric. And we do, we do ask our community, our users, um, what is working for them, what are they having trouble with in the rubric, um, so, so different things that they need to be shored up. So we do, it is a pretty comprehensive and it's a long process. It takes the better, uh, it takes almost a year to get this, this completed. And so um, we do that about every, every three years. And, and the last time we did it, um, this one just came out uh, September 1st. And uh, this is the, the fourth edition. So we're real proud of this. And thank you to our community and, and Michigan Virtual School had uh, we had um, had a user had a <laughs> one of their staff members was on the the review team so we're excited about that 
Um, okay, so two different rubrics that pertain to, to the K-12 realm. Um, so we have our K-12 secondary rubric and also our K-12 publisher rubric. So they do have a similar scope. However, they do have a, a different uh, purpose. And so our K-12 secondary rubric, that's mainly focused for local teachers and course developers who are developing courses um, on their own or they're, they're working to improve their courses. Um, and then we have our publisher rubric, which a lot of times um, people use to vet those vendor courses. So when they're looking to adopt a vendor course, they'll go through an internal review process, which I'll talk about later, um, to, to use that rubric to look and see, hey, does, is, this, is this course really one that is going to serve our students well? Um, and also people who develop their courses locally for use in other districts, they might use that publisher rubric too. So those are the two different rubrics that we have. And then our rubric is organized out by general standard areas. So there are nine general standards that you'll see the, up there on the screen. Um, and each of those have specific standards within them. Um, but you'll notice also uh, that it says their key components must align. And so when we look at the rubric, um, it's our intention that that the rubric is used holistically, so it's intended to ensure that all the parts of the course work together. Um, so you can use it like the metaphor of a cake maybe. So maybe baking cake is pretty simple if you follow the recipe and you correctly measure and use all the right ingredients. And the result is also pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward and simple. If you do it correctly, you end up with a cake. Um, reviewing an online course is much more complex. You, you have to look at all the ingredients, but also they have to work together to help to support the learning objectives. So when we talk about that, that um, alignment concept, we want to say that you know all of those critical components work together. And so it's kind of you can't have one without the other kind of thing. So that's what you'll see in our, in our rubric. Um, our rubric is divided out. It had those general standards, but then there are specific standards within those general standards, and they each have a point value. And so when we look when we look at our rubric, um, they either have a point value of three, two, or one. Um, and we our rubric is used on a non-sliding scale. So it's either you met that standard and you get all three points, or you didn't meet it and you get zero points. And, I'll talk more about that. That more comes into play with the review process itself. And then within our rubric, so we do have those, those specific standards. So those are just the standards. But within our rubric, there are a set of robust annotations. And so each one of those has look-fors, has best practices, has exemplars, so that either if you are developing a course, you can know what kinds of things you can put into your course that would meet that standard. Or if you are reviewing a course, you'll know what to look for. So does a course have you know, X, Y, and Z? Um, so th that is giving you the examples there in the rubric. So it's not just the specific standards. That workbook, that rubric workbook, is fully annotated. And it does have all of those um, robust uh, robust examples and best practices, and, and those are revised along with the specific standards every time we revise our rubric based on what's new um, and what seems to be working you know, among our communities. And that's an older version of the rubric that I was showing there. So your rubric, uh, if you have one, might look a little bit different. So I did mention that uh, the standards themselves are supported in research. And on our website, we do have a research library. So what you could do there is you could type in a specific standard, and it will generate all of the, the different research that supports it, that's out there to support it. So that's just something that I wanted to throw in there so you know um, where you can find that supporting research. And that's on our website. 
Um, okay, so the tools that go along with the rubric, those we have um, three different three different tools that I'm going to touch on today, um, and I'll start off with. All right, we have our self-review tool, we have our course review management system, and then we have something else which is called MyCR, short for My Custom Reviews. So I'll start off by talking about this self-review tool. And the self-review tool, um, that's a way for people to use the rubric kind of like on a, a, a more, um, a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so these each of these tools that I'm talking about now are populated with the rubric in them. So you'll see there's the standard there when you would go into our tool. You see the standard there. And then if you click on that annotation link, which might be really small to you, <laughs> when you click on that, it'll show those annotations. So that's populated into this automatically. Um, but then a user would be able to go in and they would be able to conduct maybe their own self-review of a course. So a self-review is just one person looking at a course. Um, they're jotting down notes to themselves, maybe, about what they can do um, to do, what they can do to improve their course. Um, sometimes schools and districts uh, in Michigan who are rolling out QM have used this tool with their teachers so that they can improve their own courses. So a member of a school or district, they can use this tool on their own, but a lot of times we'll also see um, districts use this as part of their professional development. Uh, so maybe they focus on certain standard areas, and they might chunk out and say, "Okay, this time we're gonna we're gonna create our own professional development around standard uh, st general standard area one." And so they'll have their teachers go in and take a look at their courses um, and determine what they're doing really really well and what they're doing that could use a little bit of improvement. Um, so the self-review tool um, is really good for doing that. Uh, the nice thing about that is that um, after completing those forms, um, teachers who are doing that can email reports to other colleagues. They can email this. It generates a final report that shows all of the things that they put into this. Um, and they can email it to, their, to other stakeholders if they want to, and all of these tools allow them to do that. The next one I'll talk about is that course review management system. And that allows for schools and districts to conduct collaborative reviews. So not only amongst themselves in their own school or district, but also amongst any of the other districts across the state of Michigan. So they can also use that to work with other people. A problem that we have a lot of times is that you know, there might be one English teacher in a school district who's teaching online. And so having that ability to be able to team up and work with other, um, with other practitioners who are doing the same thing as you, but maybe in another district, is a, is a really great thing. And so this tool allows our um, members to be able to do that. Um, you can use it with the K-12 publisher rubric or with the K-12 secondary rubric. So they, um, our Michigan members have access to both of those and they can, they can um, do those things. But it really helps with that tough challenge of building the capacity to be able to do course reviews like that. Um, so they can do it with other schools or districts and they can create teams um, to really join forces and team up and be able to, to provide that. And I'll talk more about how all course reviews work a little bit later, too. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was MyCR. And that's a relatively new tool for us. Uh, the cool thing about it is that you can create your own rubric, either by picking and choosing standards from, from the QM rubric that you want to include, or you can create entirely new standards um, if you have your own set of standards. And it doesn't even have to do with online courses. You know, you could. You could do it for anything else you might want to do, like teacher walkthroughs, or I've seen people use it to um, to review learning objects. Uh, so um, we, so schools and districts are using that to create their own rubrics, and then they can, and that uses the same tool that we use here at QM, and so it can be 
tailored, customized. You can pull down standards that you like from the QM rubric, add your own, um, or develop your own from scratch. So that's my CR. And I'll stop there and see if, were there any questions, Maggie? <laughs> okay, we'll have time for questions at the end too. Uh, so the next thing I'll talk about is the course review process and how um, schools and districts are using that across Michigan. Um, so we do have this course review process. It has multiple steps to it, and it does um, it is pretty pretty well encompassed. So um, you'll see there it looks like a, a circle to us on the screen, but I'll, I'll uh, flesh it out even more for you. Um, so we do have a couple of different types of reviews that I'm going to talk about today. So our members um, can do informal reviews, which is what you see there on the right side of that of the screen. And that's where you can use that course review management system that I touched on earlier to create your own groups of, of teachers who might be looking at courses um, to vet them or to uh, look at another uh, course that they have in their district already to make improvements on it. Um, those are informal reviews and those are organized by our member districts. So they're organized by you guys. Um, and then they don't have to follow any QM formal procedures. They can if they want, but they don't have to. So let's say we have three people in a formal review on a QM review. A school district can, can put two people on a review. They can put five people on a review. They can put 10 people on a review. So whatever works for you, you can do in those informal reviews. The thing that sets it aside is that there are there is no official QM recognition. You still can generate a final report. You can show what you've done um, in terms of doing your background and, and, and you know your good duty on looking at that course and making sure that it's one that you know, meets all those standards. It is a high quality course, um, but it won't have that official QM recognition, which is what you get on the other side of that chart in the formal reviews. So a formal review is, is a review that is organized by Quality Matters. There is a fee involved in it. Um, we are a nonprofit, so what we do is we have certified, oh, that shouldn't say facilitators on the screen, we have certified peer reviewers who um, have gone through our professional development and they hold that role. So they're a certified reviewer and they can, um, and then we add them to teams and they get a stipend for reviewing courses. So it could be anyone from, you know, all around um, the country who might be on a review. Um, and I'll tell you more about the composition of that. But that is fee based because we pay out our reviewers um, and they do end up in QM official recognition and so they get a certification mark that they can attach to their courses using their course catalogs. But the outcome of both of these types of reviews are the same, to improve courses, to meet your goals, and then to demonstrate your commitment to quality. So in the course review process it all starts with the course. Um, we like to say that uh, before you put a course through for at least a formal review, that it is one that has been through the ringer. So it's been taught a couple of times because it is, um, it is a significant investment to, to get your course reviewed. And so we want some of the bugs to be worked out um, before it comes to us. We do have now uh, what we call preliminary reviews. Um, and those are great for, for districts who just want to see where they stand. And so that's a, a, a quickie review by us where we have a master reviewer who goes in and takes a look at the course and gives suggestions as to um, where it could use improvement, what standards are met um, at the get-go. Um, and that's a, a great new, uh, new thing that, that some people are going to start taking advantage of that I know of. Um, so it all starts with the course, but then we go into the course review itself. 
So the course review, um, we do have a review team that we put together, and I'm going to be talking here about formal reviews. Um, so we do have three uh, QM certified course reviewers who serve on the review team. They uh, have to be experienced online instructors or course developers within the past 18 months. Um, they have to have completed QMPD in order to obtain that role. And two of the members on the team are subject matter experts, and one is a master reviewer who's gone through extra <laughs> training with, with QM. Um, so they have that extra added uh, bonus of, of being a master reviewer, and they serve as the team chair. And then also uh, an important part of our course review team is that course representative. And so they have access to the rubric before their, the review. They're involved in, in all of our discussions, and they're also consulted during the review. So the way that we score our reviews, um, each of the reviewers on that review team score um, that course individually. Um, and they score, they, but ultimately, there's one score per standard based on team majority. So if two people say that a standard was not met and one person says it's met, um, then we score it as not met. However, we do have um, points throughout the process where our review teams can come together and try to come to consensus um, on, on certain things. Um, we do have those pre-assigned point values, like I mentioned earlier. So if it's a three-point standard, it gets all three points. If it's not met, then it gets no points. So that's how it works there. Um, and we do go by this 85% rule. So when our reviewers are looking at a, a certain specific standard to see if it meets standards, they go by this 85% rule. They look for the evidence in the course. Um, and they say, OK, is this B plus worthy? Because we know that all courses have room for improvement. So we're not looking at it as 100%, but we're looking at it as you know, it's at an 85% level. And then the next part of this uh, course review process is the feedback. So each one of those reviewers, as they're reviewing a course, they're writing their own feedback, helpful feedback, to that um, teacher who submitted the course for review or the district that submitted the course. And that district gets all of that robust feedback. So they make a decision based on the standard. They decide whether or not it was meant, met or not met. And then they write a helpful recommendation. And that recommendation is based on the specific review standard, the annotations that are in the rubric workbook, and then also evidence in the course. So if it's met, um, our reviewers give um, give a best practice example. So they, you know, that standard was met, but there's always room for improvement. So maybe you could do this as well. Um, if it's not met, our our reviewers are required to help that course representative who submitted the course um, to improve the course and and meet that specific review standard. So the feedback that they write is measurable. Um, that person should be able to go back and then make those changes and ultimately meet those standards. So um, that helpful feedback, more on that. Um, that includes, they look at the specific review standard, the annotation, the course evidence. Then they write that feedback. And that's that area um, in red. They write a recommendation that has five characteristics of a helpful recommendation. And our reviewers learn all this in, in professional development. Um, that's constructive, it's specific, it's measurable, it's sensitive, and it's balanced. We really want to uh, hammer home the fact that you know creating a course is hard work, so we really want to give accolades where they're due, um, and tell those those um, course representatives, hey, you know this is you really did a great job here. Um, might I suggest that you know you make a change here or according to the rubric? So that's a helpful recommendation. We um, should have all those those parts woven into it. Um, and then, oh, 
that shouldn't say helpful feedback. All right, so factors that affect a review time. A lot of people ask me, how long does a review take? Um, we're seeing it take between 9 and 12 hours um, for our reviewers to complete a review, but there's a lot of factors that have to do with that. So it could be if the reviewer is familiar with the discipline, um, maybe if they're not familiar with the LMS um, the organiz organization of the course, it might be really well done from the get-go, so it's a little bit easier to find things. Um, and the familiar familiarity with the review process. So if they're, you know, if this is only their first or second review, it might take them a little bit longer. Um, but we find that our reviewers get better and better at it as they go along, and they get they get quicker, and you know, as they get more familiar with with the rubric. Um, and I see a question from Brenda about estimation estimation about an internal time, internal review time for one course. Um, you know, I'm not really, I think we have those numbers. I don't have them in my head right now, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to venture to guess that it's about the same time. And that would depend on, like, your teachers and how, uh, how much professional development they've had with using the rubric. Um, so if you're doing internal reviews, you know, they don't have to hold that official QM role. And so, you know, they might uh, not have taken that added step, and so they might not be as familiar with the process. So I would think that all of those factors kind of have to do with it. So here's a timeline of what happens in a review. So we have a, a pre-review call. Um, and that usually takes about two weeks to get under control, just to schedule it at all and um, and to get it all get it all going. And then our active review, where the reviewers review the course, and it usually takes about three weeks for that. And then our post review, um, which is a post review call that is done by our reviewers, um, just so that they can finalize everything, finish everything out. If anybody had any questions going forward, they're able to ask them in that in that post-review call. Um, eventually, uh, the course either meets expectations at the start, so it meets the standards, or it has to go into a revision process, which is all a part of it. Um, and that usually, we give people 20 weeks, so they have up to 20 weeks, so ultimately a review can take um, 20 weeks to meet standards, but we do have this, this hope and we know that all courses can eventually meet standards. Um, okay. I don't know, I, I guess um, for an internal review, I'm pretty much thinking that it has to do with those factors that I showed up there on the screen, but probably the same, I would venture to guess the same amount of time. Like the 9 to 12 hours. But of course that would, you know, change. And if you're not using all of the standards in your informal review, of course, that would make a difference as well. So they might have a smaller subset of standards that they're reviewing. That was a good question. Okay, so the outcome of a review, either the course meets standards, which means it's recognized by Quality Matters, it gets an official certification mark, that's used, uh, that can be used in your marketing, publicity efforts. It's listed in QM Searchable Registry on our website. Um, if it hasn't yet met standards, then changes can be made. And then our master reviewer who's on the team goes in and improves those revisions. And ultimately, the course meets standards and it's recognized. So that's our course review process. Um, we've certified over uh, 6,000 courses in these different areas, and so you might see that, that certification mark on some courses, um, and, and that's, that's the mark that they can carry it within their course. The final report pretty much looks like this. It has all of the review information, all, the, all of the reviewers' finder, findings in there, and it's all aggregated into one final report. And that, again, can be emailed out to any stakeholders who are asking about it. 
one of the things that's helpful in Michigan especially um, is our derived INACOL standards report. And what that does is um, we've done a pretty comprehensive crosswalk to see which of our standards um, would meet an INACOL standard. And so um, we do give our Quality Matters coordinators, they have the option that they can generate this INACOL standards report, which will show them according to the QM review and take them back to the QM review so they can see which standards um, populated into, let's say, A1. So they would see that the standards that, that flow into A1 are 2.1C from, from Quality Matters, 2.2C, 2.4C, 2.5C, and they can go back and then look at the feedback there. But this report gives them that INA call met, not met, which they can then um, use uh, to put in, in the catalog. So that's a pretty beneficial report for, for our Michigan users especially. Um, Third-party courses, a lot of times um, across the state we'll see those um, schools and districts who are looking um, to, to, to use third-party courses. And so we try to tell them, ask if those courses are QM certified. Um, a lot of times we'll see schools and districts who are writing QM into their RFPs um, so that um, they say, you know, you have to go to QM, get your courses certified against Michigan standards. Um, and then also ask that vendor if you can see a copy of the final report. We, um, as an organization, can't provide that final report because it belongs to them. So even if a school or district has a course that, that we've reviewed, um, we don't we don't provide that final report. That's up to them to be able to to filter out to stakeholders. Um, so we tell our we tell our member districts. We tell them you know ask those vendors for for the final report, um, or do informal reviews of your own and take a look at those courses. But look at those courses. Um, don't go you know don't just go by what the vendor says. I mean you're. You're shopping, and you're, this is really important for your students to have the best experience they can, they can. And it needs to meet the needs of your district. And so do those informal reviews um, using, using our publisher rubric. So those are two ways um, that you can vet those online courses, and that are, that are ISDs and that are school and districts um, in Michigan, what they're using to vet those courses. Um, you can look for QM certified courses on our website, and there you'll see um, just a little screenshot of, of just two of the Michigan virtual, uh, virtual school courses that um, have been recognized by Quality Matters. So you can do a search on our website, see what has already been, um, been reviewed and has met standards. So that's beneficial for, for our districts in, in Michigan as well. And then... Um, also, yeah, Chinese. Um, and then also we have that course search tool. So you can go in and, and you can specify what exactly you need and, and see if there's a course out there that has been QM certified, like Chinese. So I'll talk a little bit about our professional development opportunities um, that we're providing um, across the state of Michigan. Um, and one of them is our first flagship course, and that's a, I'll talk about that in terms of the little circle on, on the left side of your screen, and that is um, our flagship course that's applying the K-12 secondary rubric, and that teaches people how to actually um, apply the rubric, which is in the name. So they can take that rubric and use it to either, you know, how are they going to use it? How are they going to use it to either make improvements to their course? How can they use it to look and see that their course, you know, has certain components in it, just really um, hands-on practice with, with using the rubric and what it's all about. And then also we have what we call our K-12 reviewer course. That takes it a huge leap forward. And so what that does is it teaches people how to write those helpful recommendations. They actually, they actually um, participate in a mock review, so they go through and and learn how to use the course review management system. Um, and that is, has been really beneficial for both people who you know, want to serve as, 
as course reviewers and see other people's courses and really, you know, give their expertise back. Um, so to give back to our community. So, you know, um, we find out from a lot of our reviewers that 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 they always say this is the, like the best professional development experience that I've had is serving on a course review because not only am I getting a chance to see what other people are doing but I'm really having a chance to make a difference and to to you know spread the word about what I do and maybe this would work for them too um, so that's a really great opportunity but not only for being a, a QM reviewer but even for our districts who are doing internal reviews, because they really get that that practice, um, so that they can help you know their own district a little bit more and and know how to write those those helpful recommendations and use those tools a lot better. So that's our our K twelve reviewer course, um, and and thankfully uh, that is provided a, across the state of of Michigan. And then we have our K-12 Master Reviewer Certification, and that even takes it a giant leap forward. And so that one is for people who've served on at least two course reviews and they want to become a master reviewer. So they want to take that next step and be the leader of those course reviewer teams and, and be that team chair. Um, so they, they get that extra practice because our master reviewers really are Act as, a act, act as a mentor for the other reviewers on the team as well and they they make those checks and make sure that you know the the recommendations are being written properly and that the rubric is being applied as it should and each standard is so that's why we have that master reviewer on board so in Michigan what we're really looking for is to build that pool of reviewers so that we can work with one another and that's what we've taken the steps to do thus far um, so that we can really build those connections and have a pool of reviewers across the state of Maryland that you all can work with um, one another to be able to look at courses, do course reviews, um, improve your courses. Um, did I say Maryland? Yeah, I meant Michigan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Across the state of Michigan. Um, so yeah, so that will really help us. So the more teachers in our in our schools across Michigan who go through this step and learn about it and and have that common that that common language and that common understanding that is what's going to make a difference and that's what's ultimately going to make those courses as best we can for those for our students across the state so that's the goal is to try to get as many people involved in this in this process so that we can work with one another um, and so we've taken the first steps and we need you all to um, to take the next steps and, and keep it going so Chris do you want to right. it's Maggie do you want to mention, ah, there you go. Never mind. I'll shut up. <laughs> so this, now I'm going to hand it over to Justin so he can mention those things uh, that you were going to remind me to mention. Thank you. Sure. And and Maggie, once I'm done talking, please feel free to jump in and add some context too, because I know when we talked about this recently at one of our uh, the RIMSI meetings that we were invited to, I know uh, there were some things that I think uh, that we both wanted to mention. So um, it, the way things operate in Michigan now, uh, basically the, the partnership that MVU and QM have developed, um, MVU has really committed to doing a couple things. So we, we really want to, again, try to ensure that quality across the landscape that we can. Um, so again, we've decided to partner with Quality Matters to do that sort of thing. And so what MVU has committed to do uh, each year now, we are offering 10 affiliate memberships to ISDs uh, within Michigan. Uh, and so I know I think a couple of folks in attendance today are uh, members of ISDs or employees of ISDs that are affiliate members. So we appreciate you for that. And hopefully um, you'll, you'll, you'll find that opportunity valuable and can help us spread the word to, to get more, more traction in that area too. But again, we are providing the, the funding for that membership. Um, and in that regard, uh, we are then having Quality Matters kind of 
offer the professional development opportunities, offer the services uh, that they have available for those ISDs. Um, and then in the meantime, um, we are trying to provide guidance to the PSAs and the LEAs that kind of fall within or under those ISDs as well. So we, we have, have kind of envisioned the ISDs and serving in this kind of like clearinghouse role. Um, and we know that the, 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 the relationships between the, the member districts and the ISDs are complex, and that's not always uh, the way things play out. But we, we would like to see the ISDs um, try to become more of uh, kind of a clearinghouse for, for quality offerings that come through uh, that are offered by the LEAs and the PSAs too. So, and in, in that space, we're also providing guidance, like, like I said, on what the regulations are, what the actual compliance looks like for the LEAs and the PSAs, um, working with the ISDs to try to be able to build those relationships and, and, and offer the services through QM as well. Um, Maggie, does that kind of sum things up? Am I leaving something out there? That was perfect. Great. So I think I, I'm turning it back over to Chris now, or, or is, do I have another slide here? Uh, I don't think you have another slide. Yeah, that summed it up perfectly. Thank you, Justin. Actually, let me let me answer Tina's question just because it's uh, I it's on there. Actually, Tina, we pay uh, we are sending the invoices for the course that you're taking right now directly to Justin, so you can thank Justin for paying it. Um, and so that's how we actually <laughs> that's how we do it in uh, in Michigan right now. Um, uh, Chris, do you want to answer that question about ISDs and LMAs? An ISD is an intermediate school district. An LMA, hmm. I, I can maybe jump in here too, just to, you know, I, I, there are probably different names in different states for a lot of these things, right? But um, ISDs would be like like Chris said, the the intermediate school district, the 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 districts that kind of serve to provide a lot of different services. Uh, to the member districts, so they're kind of like in between um, the the state level almost, and and the LEAs or the PSAs. An LEA would be your local educating agency or your district. Uh, so you, what you would typically conceive of as a as a as a school district, and then the PSA is also a school district, but uh, in Michigan we refer to charter schools as public school academies, and so any individual charter school would actually also have its own parallel PSA district. So it, like there's, it, it, it resides within its own district. So you can think of LEAs and PSAs as kind of one and the same, but they are uh, what we would think of as school districts. And then the ISDs would be the intermediate school districts. So the ones that kind of provide uh, services to those districts. Yes, Brenda, definitely different names. And it's, it's funny, whatever state you go in, it's always, it's referred to differently. Um, some people have those intermediate school districts. Some people have educational service <laughs> centers. Some people, some states don't even have any of that. So <laughs> it's interesting. All right. So thank you, Justin, for jumping in and explaining that. I appreciate it. Um, OK, so more about our professional development. So I showed you those courses that are being sponsored by Michigan Virtual. Um, but we do have other offerings as well um, for, for any of our members and districts that they can participate in. Um, we do have an introduction to teaching online course. We have a designing your online course, which we've had um, quite a number of, of teachers across the state of Maryland that have been um, going through that course. I'm at Maryland, I said it again, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Michigan, that have gone through that course. And then we also have um, our Designing Your Blended course. Um, we have in Flipping Your Class and More. Uh, so we, we have that course as well. And then we, we have something new that we just rolled out in this past year, which is our Teaching Online Certificate, which is a series of seven workshops um, that teachers can take. Um, that ultimately culminate in one big um, uh, 
credential, so kind of like a badge, um, so that they've met met all of the different requirements for the teaching online certificate, and they can take them in any order that they want. So that's another thing that we have, and then we also have our web conferencing workshops, which are shorter snippets of PD, um, and they take about two hours in length, um, and those those take place. They are facilitated, and they're kind of like a webinar format, but they're facilitated. We have breakout rooms and, and activities that go along with them. So those are really fun and, and some other things to check out. And then our members also can do their own, um, create their own internal PD as to um, their needs. So district needs, you can create that for them. So in our community, I just kind of wanted to end with these this couple of things. So we've, we've trained over 45,000 teachers, um, higher ed faculty members, um, instructional designers. We do have an instructional designer association um, that any of our members can be involved with. And we've, we've certified um, over 8,500 people to hold roles uh, in QM. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then I just wanted to, to leave off with, with the reasons why, why, this is in, why this is so important. And why this is so important, um, what does it mean to our stakeholders, especially in light of course choice, of course access, um, what does having this certification mark on your courses mean for, for students, parents, and schools and districts, and just having a quality assurance process in general. Um, so for parents, it means that when their child takes a course that has gone through that rigorous review process, they have a better chance for success, and parents, they can kind of relax knowing that those courses give their students predictable access to their teachers and effective communication tools, and they know that their kids will receive those clear expectations and all the guidance they need for completing that course successfully. And they'll know that grading standards and assessments of their learning, they'll be consistent with the content and the course activities. And for schools and districts, it means that when their students enroll in, in one of these courses, they've made a choice to provide quality design courses um, built on research, research and supported um, by published best practices. And they can, if they have that certification mark as a result of a, a formal Quality Matters review, they can display that, um, that certification mark. Uh, as an assurance of course quality, and hopefully they display it loud and proud because um, they know these courses have been through a rigorous external review by a certified trained team that has validated that their course has met standards. And then for students, and that's why we're really here. For the student, it means that they know that they'll be getting a course designed to give them an exceptional learning experience. And while there are a lot of factors in that, um, those learners will find clear expectations and guidance to make sure that they're off to a good start. They'll find content that's relevant and purposeful and activities that are interactive and varied. And they'll know they have opportunities to measure their own learning throughout the course. Um, and technology that helps to facilitate them with that learning experience. And again, that student is really why we're all here. Finding and delivering best opportunities for them. That's what's most important. So, Together, and with this partnership, um, we can make their online learning experience exceptional. So I wanted to end with that, and I wanted to let um, Justin talk more about, just in the last couple minutes we have here, about uh, MVU's role. Hey, hey, Chris and Justin, before you do that, uh, Chris, could you take a look at Brenda's last question having to do with courses qualifying for recertification? I don't, I'm pretty sure I don't know the answer to that one. forward. Sorry, I had to undo my mic. Um, yeah, so um, those courses, they are up for recertification. Um, our courses, that certification lasts for our publisher courses. They la That certification um, will last for three years, and for our secondary, um, K-12 secondary courses, it's a five-year. Um, after five years, they need to get that, that course renewed, and we do have um, different guidelines that uh, we can show you 
for determining whether it needs to be renewed before that before that time period ends as far as you know if you've made significant changes to the course and we have guidelines on that yeah I think she actually I'm I'm sorry but I, I think yeah she's asking about teacher the the I think the course is like the APP and the our reviewer course or um, continuing education units right so different ways we do that we have to work with um, specific districts and and states um, in order to to get those those um, those continuing education units and uh, we do provide uh, graduate credit through Ashland University for the applying course and also for um, the reviewer course um, but we do provide any of the documents that is needed to secure that those CEU those CEUs Okay, I, I think maybe there's some other loose ends being tied up in the chat there, Tina. Um, I, I hope that answered your question about you know our continuing clock hours here in our state, and it sounds like Maggie may want some more information on that too. But um, I'll go ahead and, and wrap up our little portion here just to kind of reiterate what our organization's role is uh, here in Michigan. Uh, you know, we are going to continue to support the training opportunities for the ISDs and for our own uh, staff members here, again, to try and um, do all that we can to, to kind of focus on quality here in the state when it comes to K-12 online learning. Uh, we'll also be reviewing our own courses. So we've committed to having 20 MVS courses reviewed uh, over the course of the kind of 16, 17 fiscal year. Uh, we have that commitment still going so um, we are continuing to put those courses in if you're interested in becoming a reviewer as uh, Chris touched on today and you'd like to review MVS courses there will be courses there for you to review if, if you are going down that path of becoming a reviewer um, we are supporting our own self-organized review or not our own self-organizing reviews but uh, districts who want to self-organize their own reviews uh, we do have our own documentation uh, and recommended processes around how to conduct your, your reviews of your own courses there or courses that you choose to offer under things like 21F. So clicking that link there will bring you to some of the documentation that we've produced. Uh, and it also has uh, included there the QM process and the QM INA call, um, QM walk, uh, what, what do we call that, crosswalk, thank you, and the, and the, derived, uh, the, the derived results there as well. Uh, and, and lastly, this is something that we're really excited about. Uh, we're we're going to have some meetings coming up here soon to figure out more ways that we can promote Quality Matters offerings through our own professional learning services initiative. So a division of our organization here is focused on providing professional learning courses for educators throughout the state, and we want to be able to get more folks enrolled in Quality Matters courses. So we're working out ways that we can integrate our own systems there and, and promote more QM offerings through what we do in terms of professional learning. So uh, we're really excited to tackle that initiative too. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris to see if she has any last. I don't, only that um, we thank you so much for, for coming today. And as always, we're here um, to help you. So if there's anything you need from us, um, Maggie or I would would be more than happy to help you out with that. Um, I think most of you uh, here have our contact information. Um, and, and if not, uh, I know it's not on the slide, but I can put my, I, I put our email addresses in the chat. Um, but if there's no other questions, yeah, and folks can feel free to reach out to me. Most of the time, I'm just contacting Maggie <laughs> for an answer for a question that I get, but um, I'm happy to help however I can. Yeah, uh, we're, we're really excited about this partnership, and um, I think so far, so far we've been doing some good work. So we're excited to, to see where it where it all leads. That's great, and and us as well. We're really excited to to have the partnership here and be able to do all that we can, like I said, to kind of ensure quality in the state. So just a, a couple housekeeping things from me. These are, you know, just kind of our standard things that we mention at the end of all of our webinars. Um, just want to make mention of a couple of initiatives that we have. 
from our institute, we have a podcast series that I get the fortune of, of hosting. So if you're interested in listening to folks talk about their work all around the country in K-12 online and blended learning, maybe how they use research, how research impacts their practice, other things that they're doing in K-12 and online, uh, K-12 online and blended, you can check out our podcast series called Virtual Viewpoints. You can also find us in like the podcast app on your phone, like uh, the Google Play Store, the iTunes as well. Um, we have a guest blogger program. So if you're interested in writing for us on our blog platform, if you'd like to share some of your own work, some of your own research, whatever you have going on, you can check out our guest blogger program initiative there to learn more about things that we like to highlight. And then we do have a webinar upcoming uh, that would be next month, actually. So we, we, we've had a lot of webinars in the month of, of April, so we're taking a little bit of a break, but we have one next week. So this is more on the side of our kind of like research uh, in, interest, but we have some researchers from George Mason University and University of Kansas who are going to be talking about presence as a support in a blended learning classroom. Maggie, I see, I see you have your hand up. Did you want to mention something before I wrap us up? No, I must have hit a button incorrectly. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure everyone's called on. You know, I'm doing the, the, the classroom classroom technique here. Good for you. <laughs> Um, so, so just lastly, uh, if you're interested to learn more about our, our organization, if you have feedback for us about what we do, you can email us at mvlri at mivu.org. You can sign up for our mailing list where we advertise these webinars and some of our other offerings and events. Um, you can click the link there to, to sign up for that mailing list. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, again, where we promote most of our work that's going on, our events that we're hosting. Uh, you can find all the recordings of the webinars that we do. We typically have about 12 to 15 webinars per year. Uh, so they're hosted, all the recordings on our YouTube channel there. The recording of this webinar will be up within the next day or so. So we encourage you to share it with folks who might have an interest in the partnership with QM and the work that we're doing here in our state with QM. And you can see a list of all of our upcoming webinars at our website, mvlri.org slash presentations slash webinars. With that, I will wrap us up. Thank you all again so much for coming, and we really appreciate chatting with you today. Take care.